Uh, the goal of this lecture is to first give you a very broad introduction uh, or a very high level introduction uh, to how modern processors work. Um, and so this is so that you can, you know, when you write programs and when you try to optimize the performance of your programs, that you understand at a high level what mechanisms are going on. Um, how is the processor trying to help you improve performance? Um, and then on the second part of the, of the lecture, we're going to focus on brand's prediction. And, and here we'll discuss a technique that is going to be quite useful for your design project. Okay, so just as a reminder, this is the iron uh, law of processor performance, um, where remember we want to divide uh, or express performance as the product of, two, uh, of uh, three different terms, the instructions that its program takes, the cycles per instruction or CPI that, it's, uh, uh, that the processor takes to execute the instructions in the program, and the time per cycle or the clock uh, cycle time. Right? And so you can improve any of these three and that will improve the performance of your system. Um, we're going to focus, as before, in the last two terms in CPI and, and uh, clock cycle time. So remember that when we introduced pipelining, we said, well, you know, pipelining is a good technique to reduce clock cycle time and therefore improve clock cycle, uh, sorry, improve uh, clock frequency, right? That's the reason why you have processors today that can run at three, four gigahertz. Um, that's because they have, you know, 10, 20, 30 pipeline stages. Um, but the other, Component here is CPI, is the number of cycles per instruction that our processor takes on average uh, in, in a particular program. Um, and so let's be a little bit more systematic about how we um, try to improve CPI by first dividing it into two different terms. Uh, so I'm going to say that the CPI, the cycles per instruction, can be divided into two components, what we call CPI ideal. Uh, which is the cycles per instruction that your machine would achieve if there, if there were no stalls, if there were no mispredictions, if essentially you could execute the maximum amount of instructions through the pipeline um, every cycle. Plus another component that we're going to call the CPI hazard. Right? This is the contribution of data and control hazards to the cycles per instruction. Right? So you can see hazards either th uh, you know, due to memory accesses, due to operations uh, that have dependencies on data values um, as adding cycles. Right? They're adding cycles to each instruction that you're executing. Uh, and so on average, this is going to contribute to the CPI. Uh, but also control hazards. So you know, when you have branches, when you have jumps, also when you have exceptions, um, an exception, remember, is an implicit branch on, on every instruction. And so that is going to add uh, also some extra cycles due to these control hazards that we need to handle. OK, so we started with uh, looking at this classic five states pipeline, right? Where we had you know, fetch, decode, execute, memory access, and, and uh, write back. Um, and so this has, you know, it's a very simple design. You're basically starting from something very similar, uh, even a little bit simpler in, in the design project. Um, and it is still used if you don't want super high performance. So, um, you know, many uh, chips used in embedded devices and things like network routers, like Wi-Fi, access points and uh, you know, other devices will, will have, uh, for example, low power ARM processors that implement precisely this, this pipeline. Um, but this has some problems, right? Even though the ideal CPI is one, you know, there's, well, the upper performance bound is a CPI of one. We can actually do better, we, uh, as, as, we will dis as we will discuss later. Um, when you have a high latency instruction, for example, if you have a cache miss on the memory states, you know, the problem is that now everything behind this instruction that causes a stall also stalls, right? So a single, um, a single stall propagates immediately through, through the pipeline. Um, and of course, you know, if you have long operations, for example, you have a multiplier that you'd like to pipeline and take you know, three or four or five cycles, um, now you need to dramatically increase the number of stages in your, in your um, design, right? And so uh, just five stages often doesn't suffice to have or to include enough time to do um, you know, complex operations. Okay, so there are essentially four things that we can do to improve the performance of this pipeline. There are two that are fairly simple. Um, so we can keep pipelining, right? Um, 
keep dividing our pipeline into more and more stages to increase the clock frequency. Another, uh, you know, conceptually simple, although mechanically quite complicated optimization, is what we call wider pipelines, where instead of executing one instruction per cycle, we're going to try to fetch, decode, execute, and so on, multiple instructions for every cycle. Then the problem is that if we just apply these techniques, our performance is not going to be good because yes, we're reducing um, the clock cycle time, we're getting a great frequency, we're reducing the ideal CPI, but we still have to deal with hazards. And so there are basically two techniques that are used to deal with hazards. When we talk about data hazards, typically these are handled by what we call out of order execution, where instead of executing instructions in the order that they appear in the program, the processor will try to execute instructions as soon as their source operands are available. And the second technique that we will see in more detail is essentially uh, reducing the impact of control hazards through what we call branch prediction. But really this is prediction of branches and jumps. Um, and so we're going to try to do better predictions than just PC plus four when we're trying to figure out what is the next PC that our uh, pipeline should fetch. Okay, so I'll explain the first three techniques fairly quickly, and this is purely for demystification purposes. It's not going to be on the quiz. This is just so that you understand when you, you know, have a program running in a modern processor, why is it that, you know, you might see that the code has a certain data dependence and somehow the processor actually is overlapping things in ways that you don't expect. That's because of some of these techniques. Okay, so deeper pipelines, essentially the key idea here is if five stages were good, then 10 must be better, then 15 must be better, right? So instead of having five stages, we can keep uh, breaking up the work that we uh, do into more and more and more stages. So instead of you know, having a single, a single cycle for fetching, we can have two cycles, which allows us to clock the memory faster or to use larger memories. We can uh, break up decode into decode and re read registers and so on and so forth. Right? And so, uh, you know, this is good because basically to a good degree, this is the main weapon that modern processors use to run at multiple, multiple gigahertz. So for example, you know, designs in the early 2000s had around 11, 12 stages. Uh, in the mid 2000s, uh, you know, there, there was a period of time where the main w uh, way to sell performance was frequency. And so um, even if processors didn't do much work per clock cycle, um, basically processor designers got into this race of how much can we pipeline these, um, uh, these uh, processors so that we can sell you processors that run at four gigahertz instead of three gigahertz because you know, people want a single number to summarize performance. Um, and so that's why you have designs like the Pentium 4 that has 34 pipeline stages. It's a little bit on the high end and so uh, these days we'll, we'll, you'll see designs that have 16 to 20 pipeline stages. So there are some costs, of course, you know, the obvious one is you have more pipeline registers, right? But also you're going to have more bypass paths, right? So remember that, you know, if you have sequences of instructions here that have uh, dependencies, uh, you want to be able to bypass the value, uh, the source operand that might be, you know, down in these stages uh, right before it is consumed. So in this case, at the output of the read register stage, you would need a bypass path from here, from here, from here, and also from here, right? And so you'd need to add more and more and more bypass paths over time. You know, remember, maxes are expensive, wires are also expensive, and so this doesn't scale very well. Okay, and so all in all, right, the, the more you overlap, the more dependencies you're going to have, right? So the more instructions we have through the pipeline, the more, the longer our dependencies are going among nearby instructions are going to hurt us in terms of cycles, right? Because, you know, things that used to have, so for example, if, um, you know, if before on every mispredicted branch, we were incurring a penalty of two cycles or two instructions. Now, you know, our cycles might be very fast, but if we're resolving branches in stage five, we're going to incur a penalty of five instructions, right? We're going to throw out five instructions on every misprediction. Uh, there is also the issue that at some point, clock, um, 
clocking overheads, things like the setup time of the registers uh, becomes dominant, right? So if you're spending more time on the setup time of the registers than on the actual logic of its pipeline states, you actually don't get a lot of performance benefit. Uh, and finally, you know, with very high clock frequencies, you basically increase power consumption by a lot. Um, and so uh, this also runs into limitations. Okay, any questions? All right, so the other broad technique that we can use is to, instead of trying to have this very high clock frequency, have a wider pipeline where every state processes multiple instructions per cycle. So for example, um, in this pipeline over here, I'm showing four different, you know, its pipeline register has four different elements, which represent four different instructions, right? And so here the idea is that, you know, you're gonna have a very wide, instruction cache or a very wide instruction memory, and instead of giving you 32 bits, it would give you 128 bits, right? Four instructions, PC plus four, or PC, PC plus four, plus eight, plus 12. Right, so you can fetch a chunk of four instructions, then you can decode them in parallel, read the registers in parallel, execute them in parallel, You're, you'll need four ALUs, but you, know, you can do that. Um, if they need to access memory, you can do these memory accesses in parallel, and so on. So this attacks the CPI ideal component that I mentioned, right? So now if we have a pipeline of width W, we're going to have a CPI ideal of one over W, right? Because in the best case, each instruction takes one over W cycles. In other words, every cycle we're executing W instructions, right? Okay. So modern processors will routinely try to de fetch, decode, execute three to four instructions per cycle. And so if you're writing high performance code, it helps to you know, do it in a way where you don't have very tight dependencies because of course, if you have a dependence between two instructions in the same cycle, Right. At some point, you're, the processor is not going to be able to push through all these dependent instructions through the pipeline in the same cycle. Right. You want to do some amount, some measure of independent work. Okay. The problem with this technique is that actually there are a lot of quadratic overheads. You need a wider instruction cache. You need more ALUs. You need a register file that, you know, in this case, instead of uh, two reports, has eight reports, and that adds a lot of wiring again. Um, and so. You know, all of this also comes at the expense of when you have, because you're trying to execute multiple instructions in each cycle, as I said, you're, the impact of hazards is going to grow, right? So, um, you know, you're going to have many cases where you have dependent instructions here that cannot progress through the pipeline in the same cycle, and so you might need to hold off on some of the instructions that are fetched or decoded for a few cycles. Okay, so this is something that you could actually try to do in the design project. Uh, it's kind of complicated, but you know, a super scalar pipeline that tries to run a couple of instructions per cycle could be doable. Uh, but there are simpler techniques. And you, don't, you absolutely do not need to do this to, to get full points. Okay, so this brings us to the issue of hazards. And, and specifically, you know, data hazards. So we have these, these three strategies, right? Stall, bypass, speculate. We use stalling and bypassing for data hazards. We use either stalling or speculation for control hazards. So we said, you know, control hazards are, uh, allow speculation because it's easy to make good guesses, right? And so um, we'll see that it's actually easy to make really good guesses in the last part of the, of, of the lecture uh, but now I want to focus on data hazards and, and essentially introduce a fourth technique, a fourth strategy, which is essentially to find something else to do. If you have a, an instruction that depends on some value that's not yet available, on some data value that's not yet avail available, for example, you know, there's a load and then there's another instruction that's consuming that load, well, you could stall, right? It, predicting it doesn't really work. Bypassing it doesn't really work because you're still fetching it from memory. But what if there's some other instruction <coughs> downstream, right? Not the next instruction in, in program order, but some other instruction later on that's actually independent, that's operating on independent data, 
And so the, day, uh, the way to do this is through what we call out-of-order execution. Not a very good marketing term. You know, you won't see lots of uh, processors saying, you know, we'll, we'll sell you an out-of-order processor. I think Intel calls this uh, dynamic execution or some other thing. Um, but, you know, the technical term is, is what we call out-of-order execution because essentially what we're trying to do is execute instructions in what we call data flow order, or as soon as their input operands are available. And so to see how this works, consider this expression. You want to compute D, um, you know, it's 3 times A minus B plus 7 times A times C. And so both A, B, and C are in memory, so you're going to have to load them. And uh, then we're going to do some computations to produce D, and finally we're going to store D also to some location in memory. And so you could produce, you know, a compiler pr could produce the sequential code, right? The sequence of instructions to compute D, where it loads A, then it loads B, then it subtracts A and B, then it multiplies three times A minus B, right? And so it gets this part of the, of, uh, the term. Then it loads C because it needs C to uh, produce the second part of the term, multiplies a times c, uh, set, computes through another multiply seven times a times c, then finally adds everything up, stores the result. But not every instruction here depends on the result of previous instructions, right? So instead we can represent this computation as what we call a data flow graph. And so in a data flow graph, uh, nodes or vertices represent computations or operations. And then edges between the vertices represent input or output data that's flowing between these operations. So here you can see that you know we can load B, A, and C, right? And then this minus operation takes B and A as input, right? And so on. And so you can see through by by expressing things as this data flow graph, you can see that not everything is dependent. Right? In fact, if you have a stall in this load B instruction. You could actually run instructions down below here, right? Load C, mol AC, mol 7AC, that don't depend on, the, on B. And so here's pictorially how this, this works, right? So the processor is trying to execute B, right? So B has not completed execution yet. But it can make progress through operations that are not dependent on the results of B. And so it is, you know, it, in, in this case it has already completed the execution of A times C. It has completed the loads of A and C. It is executing 7 times A times C and so on. And so what processors will actually do is you pass them this sequential code right, this series of instructions, they will dynamically recover the data flow graph, right, they will dynamically recreate this, this graph internally, and then they will run instruction as, as, as soon as they can. Okay, so here's how, how it all looks like if, if you put all of these techniques together. So you have, you know, lots of different stages, um, you know, three or four instructions per stage. Um, basically, there's a first part of, of the processor that fetches instructions in order and tries to decode them in order and then essentially it reconstructs this data flow graph um, that stores all the dependencies between instructions. Then we have what we call an uh, out of order execution phase where we execute its, its instruction using different functional units as soon as its source operands are available and finally we write back the results into the register file or into memory in program order. So we have this last phase where there's some last stage that is doing all the writes in order. Can you tell me why we need to do all the writes in order? <coughs> yes? No. But it does have to do with misspeculation. So, if so, any other yes. Uh, I, I guess like if you're doing some math, right, and you you calculate one thing first, <coughs> and you calculate the value of one variable first, 
and maybe before it's used, it's hard to fight yeah, right. yeah, because I guess I get done. It's hard to say. So by looking at just straight line code, it's hard to see. But what's happening here is we're using the same speculation tricks that we were using in our simpler pipelines. So for every branch, we are predicting what the next address is going to be. And then that means that we might execute some work that we shouldn't have executed. And because you can run work much more widely out of order in these systems, some instructions might actually make it all the way through execute, and you might have the results ready to be written back, and yet that work should be discarded. And so that's why there's a last phase that reorders everything. So this is a subtle point. Um, this is also, you know, when you start looking at these complex pipelines and the interaction with other mechanisms like TLBs and virtual memory, um, you know, basically now you have all the ingredients that you need to understand all these uh, modern security or all these recent security attacks uh, like Meltdown and Spectre um, that essentially rely on this out-of-order execution feature. Um, and so they're, they're running work uh, very far ahead, uh, essentially misusing these, these execution resources to leak information. Okay. So uh, that concludes our discussion of the three techniques. But so at a high level, what happens is you have this very long pipeline, right? You have this technique that's trying to execute instructions based on their dependencies rather than in their order in the, in, in the program. Um, and now the issue that we have remaining and what I want to focus on for the rest of the lecture is how to, do we handle control flow hazards? Um, and so you end up with these fairly long pipelines, right? Um, and you know, in, in recent processors, you'll take anywhere from 10, 15 cycles from when a branch is fetched until it is resolved, until it is executed and you actually know for sure whether the next PC was what you predicted or something else. And so this is what we call a, a loose loop. We say that you know, when you have a lot of pipeline stages between two events that essentially create a dependence through the pipeline, this is a loose loop. And it's a loose loop because you know, there's more than one pipeline stage between them. And that's going to um, impact performance. OK, so how much, how much performance do we lose every time that the pipeline doesn't follow correct instruction flow. So if we have a branch here and we mispredict the next PC, we send it down and then let's say 15 cycles later, we figure out that that's the wrong path. And so we need to redirect the pipeline. How much work have we lost here? Yes. Is it about the same work that we do to like set up the pipeline? Yeah. Because everything behind it is going to be invalid, so we need exactly. To exactly. So if you were in executing one instruction in each stage, right, it would just be the number of stages, right? Because that's how many instructions you could have in flight. In fact, it's even worse because your pipelines can execute multiple instructions per cycle, right? So in modern processors, each Brand's misprediction will waste 40 to 50 instructions. And so the problem is that branches happen every 5 to 20 instructions. So if every 5 to 20 instructions, let's say we're mispredicting 50% of the branches because we're just doing PC plus 4, we're predicting PC plus 4, then once every, let's say, 10 instructions, we are adding all this waste, right? We're throwing away 30 instructions. Is this good? Like, what's the performance impact of that? If once every 10 instructions, we're taking 30 instructions worth of work that come after and throwing them out, right? Turning them into no ops and then restarting execution, then you have 10, 10 instructions worth of useful work, 30 instructions wasted, right? So your performance impact is 4x. Right? You're wasting most of your execution resources because you're not following the right path. Yes? Um, what does it mean that we're losing work, though? Because, like, I mean, if, if 
Absolutely. So you are losing work because you're executing work that you end up discarding. Now, if you were able to take better guesses, you wouldn't be losing work. So imagine that in the best case, you had some magical device here that always told you what the next PC was, right? And so in that case, you would be able to do much better. This is, this is why you know, I say that we're losing work. And in fact, what we're going to see in the rest of the lecture is that you can get very close. You can predict 99, 99.5% of branches, and uh, modern processors take one misprediction or have one misprediction mis every thousand cycles or so. Okay? So again, the name of the game here is to improve the accuracy of guesses. Um, and so let's go back to you know, risk five branches and jumps. And so remember that control flow hazards happen because each instruction fetch depends on information from the preceding instruction or you know, some, preceding, some number of preceding instructions ahead. Um, and so we want to know two things. Is this a branch or a jump? Right? Is this a is this something that alters control flow, or is it going to go to PC plus four? And if it is taken, if it's a taken branch or a jump, then what is the target? When can, what is the earliest point at which we can know the target? And so for different instructions, in instruction types, you'll have different points in the pipeline at, at which you'll know. Now, you know, as I, as I uh, mentioned a few lectures ago, this is specific to your pipeline. But let's go through this exercise by thinking, you know, when, what is the earliest that we can find, uh, you know, both whether it is, at, whether it's taken, um, and what, if it's taken, what the target is. So for a jump and link, right, a jump and link computes the next PC using the immediate and the current PC, right? So when do you know it's taken? What's the earliest you can know in the pipeline that it's taken? Yes, decode, yep. Once, once you fetch the instruction, you can take a look and say, yep, this is, this is a jump on link, that's the opcode. So I know that I'm going to have to redirect the PC. When do you know the target? When do you know what's, what the next PC is? After, after you've accessed the register file? Uh, Almost. <laughs> if this was a jump on link register, then yes. But this is a jump on link, and so the next PC comes from the PC plus the immediate. Yes? So, I guess decode? Yeah. As early as decode, you can stick an other in there and compute the next PC. Right, so jump on link is sort of the best case. So jump on link register, taken, same thing, right? We can take a look at the opcode and know that it's a jump, and therefore we're going to change the PC, for sure, after decode. But when is the target known? After execute. After execute, right? So you need to at least read the register and do some computation with it. Now, you could have some pipeline where you have a register read stage and you, know, you stick another in there and you know, if the timing fits, you could um, know the target a little bit earlier too, right? How about branches? When do you know it's taken? Yes. At, at, after execute, exactly. Right? Because we need to read the registers, compare them, figure out whether the branch condition is met or not, and that's going to take some time. When is the target node, though? So the target for, for jump and link and the target for branches is exactly the same. It's exactly the same computation. So you actually know the target in decode. OK. So armed with all of this, let's start seeing how we can improve performance with better branch prediction. And so I said the name of the game here is to make good guesses. To, we've been guessing PC plus four as the next value of, of, or the value of the next PC, but we're going to discuss a few strategies that let, let us predict both the target and the branch condition for branches much better. So one thing you can do, and something that some ISAs do, is what's called static branch prediction. So for example, um, you know, in general, if you, 
and this is very empirical, you basically have to take your application and take a look at how many branches there are, how many branches are taken. Um, so you'll see that most branches, you know, most applications, 60 to 70 percent of the branches are actually taken. And so if you're predicting uh, PC plus four all the time, you'll be incurring, you know, 70 percent of the branches, you'll be mispredicting them. But you can actually do some, some analysis and say, well, what happens if, uh, you know, let's, let's separate two cases in branches, right? If I am jumping backwards, so if I am jumping to some earlier PC, some, some smaller PC than that of the branch instruction, and, um, you know, what if the branch jumps forward? Branch to, uh, um, jumps to, or branches to a later PC which you of course can distinguish by looking at the offset, right? You don't need to compute the condition. Now, it, as it turns out, backward branches are taken you know, over 90% of the time. Forward branches are taken about half of the time. Can you guess why? Yes, so backward branches are, are loops, right? You're always going back to the beginning of the loop. So it's much more frequently to be taken. Forward branches tend, tend to be if-else conditions. Right? And so you can start building things that, you know, building a little bit of logic that as early as decode says, oh, well, you know, if, if this is backward, if this is a backward branch, I'm going to predict that it's taken. And so I'm, I'm going to redirect control flow earlier. So some ISA is actually add instructions to give hints to essentially tell the processor, look, this is a branch if not equal, but assume that it's going to be taken, or assume that it's not going to be taken. Um, and so by doing this, by just adding these hints uh, through the proper you know, compiler analysis and so on, uh, we can achieve 80% accuracy in branch prediction, which is not bad. We have two problems though. First, you have risk five, so we cannot change the ISA. And second, it's actually much easier, you can do much better with very simple hardware without resorting to these uh, ISA changes. And so, what most processors do today is what we call dynamic branch prediction, where essentially we have some device here that, um, given a PC, computes some prediction and gives us some very fast prediction of the next PC. And then once we know what the right next PC is, if this predictor was wrong, we basically give it some feedback to retrain it. So this is a feedback driven predictor. It is, uh, you know, we're, when, when it does something wrong, we're, we're updating it so that it learns over time about the behavior of the program. And this works because of two things what we call temporal correlation. So if, um, you know, it's often the case that the way that a branch resolves, either taken or not taken, is the same over time. So for example, on a loop, right, you're always, it's going to be taken most of the time. Um, if, as another example, you have some assertion in your code, right, that's evaluating whether some condition uh, is met, but that's very rare, you're gonna have a branch, but that branch is basically never going to be taken. Right, and so it's very easy to predict for, for some simple hardware to predict, you know, not, not taken, not taken, not taken. Um, the other kind of, uh, of information that modern processors leverage but we're not going to get to see is what we call spatial correlation, which happens uh, because in, in many pieces of code, you often have branches that will resolve in the same way, in a correlated way. Um, and so that's because you have some small number of paths of, ex of execution through, through the code. Um, but you know, this is more advanced and we won't get to see it today. Now, there are many different branch prediction strategies. Uh, I am going to focus on you know, a very simple one that's actually very useful for the design project. Um, and this is what we call the branch target buffer or BTB in short. And so the branch target buffer is a cache for branch targets. So here's how it works. You know, this is, we take the PC, you know, on, at the beginning of fetch, we index, we take some bits of the PC and we index into this table, right, which is basically a cache. We have a tag, we have the target PC for, you know, the predicted PC for, for this PC, 
and then we have a valid bid, just like a cache, right? But instead of being a cache for data, this is a cache of predictions. It's telling us, you know, for this PC, what is the next PC that you should run? And so the way that we're going to manage this is if there's a hit, we're going to take it, right? If there's a match here, we're going to take the target and use it as an XPC. If there isn't a hit or we hit on some invalid line, then we'll just use PC plus four. And so the key idea here is that for taken branches and for jumps, we are going to have an entry that tells us what the next PC should be. And we're going to train this, um, this, this BTB so that whenever we see that there was a taken branch or a jump, we're going to store the, the PC target PC pair in, in this little cache. And then when we run through it next, we'll make the right prediction, assuming that the branch is still taken. <coughs> okay, so in, in a little bit more detail, here's how it looks, right? So we want to predict the next PC immediately. And so we add this BTB. Right, where we feed the PC and we immediately get the prediction for the next PC value. So this, instead of a loose loop, is what we call a tight loop. Right, there's no, this, is, this all happens on the same cycle. And then when we find out what the actual result is, if there's a misprediction, we still need to go and adjust the BTB and adjust the PC. Right? But the key difference here is that we're going to take this penalty much less frequently if we're making good predictions. Right? Okay. So, some implementation details. So here's, here's the same picture as before. We're, you know, also there's the instruction memory here. So we're taking the whole PC and using it to index into the instruction memory. So one key thing and one key difference between uh, BTBs and caches is that a BTB is a cache for predictions. And so if I give you a wrong value in a cache, because I'm not storing, let's say, the tags right, or I'm not storing all the bits of the data and I'm making up some, some, some bits, then you'll just have, you know, your execution will be wrong. But in a BTB, what happens if I give the wrong value? What happens if I, you know, give some PC, some target PC, that is not in fact the right target PC. You're gonna end up flushing? Yeah, so there's some penalty, but it's still correct, right? So basically what you have here is a uh, accuracy trade-off rather than a correctness trade-off, which isn't really a trade-off at all. And so the, the point here is that there are some very easy ways that you can make for a very small and efficient BTB. And I mention this specifically because if you want to get a good clock cycle time, you might want to make your BTB small by shaving off some bits. So because it's just a prediction, one thing we can do is let's say that we don't store all the bits of the PC as the tag, right? So instead of using, um, you know, let's say that you have 64 entries here, and so you have six bits in the PC. Um, so there are two bits of the offset that you're not going to use. Uh, that leaves you with 24 remaining bits, right? That if you wanted to get a full tag, you would need 24 bits in the tag. But, eh, it's a store four or five bits of the tag, right? That's an easier match. Take the, the next four or five bits. And if you have a conflict, well, you'll return the wrong PC. Still fine. Right? There will be some misprediction, but you're shaving off a whole lot of bits by just storing part of the PC. Yes? So when you say invalid PC, um, the case that you're talking about means that you're fetching like, the, you're fetching the a value that's not what you want to fetch. Exactly, so what happens is that you can have two jumps that have the same, fall on the same index and have the same four or five tag bits that you're storing. And so you actually have a conflict there. But that's okay. You know, in that case, you'll, you'll have a misprediction. Yes? So a lot of these principles are, they kind of like assume that assembly code is written in a certain kind of style, right? If, 
certain assembly code is written with like different styles, then sometimes does that mess up the principles that we're trying to use? This is actually not assuming much about the style of assembly that you have. There are some other more sophisticated predictors that actually make some deeper assumptions. But this is fairly general. So you're storing the target PC. If it's there, you use it. If it's not, you don't. And so for taking branches and jumps, this, this tends to work well. OK, some other ways of uh, saving state. You don't even need to store all the bits of the target PC. right? This is, instead of 32 bits, you can store you know, 12 bits of the target PC and then fill in the rest of the bits with the, with the current PC. And again, you'll have some incorrect mispredictions if you're jumping far away, but most jumps and branches are fairly close by. right? So same deal. You'll get less prediction accuracy, but much less overhead. Yes? What's the advantage of, I guess, making shrinking tags and the stored PC? So suppose that you have cycle time problems in your fetch stage, right? Because by adding this, now you need to index into this table, and how large you can make this table affects accuracy. But also, you know, how wide it is is going to determine how many picoseconds you take from when you index into here until you know you do the match and get the target PC out, right? And so the problem is that. The trade-off that you have here is that if you can reduce the size of uh, you know, the number of bits here, typically you can have a larger, you can have more entries uh, without increasing the, the clock cycle time. And so that is a good thing for accuracy, accuracy generally. But I mean, basically these are implementation tricks that may or may not help you on the design project depending on how low a frequent or how high a frequency you're targeting. OK. Yes? Is it accessing the BTD every cycle? Yes. And this, this is in like a branch instruction or something like that? No, because at that point, you don't even know that it's a branch instruction. So for every PC, you're accessing the BTD. This is why I'm also insisting that this should be small and not, not you know, be some huge memory. Uh, the, other, uh, the other thing here is that you're going to have to implement this with registers because you want combinational reads, right? On the same cycle, you want to read it and get the data out as quickly as possible. And so typically, you don't use as run for this. You use, um, you use registers. All right. Great. So another thing you can do, not even store the valid bit, although we'll see why the valid bits might be, might be good in a couple of slides. So just as a... You know, hint, even small BTBs can get you a lot of performance improvement. Uh, so in a little bit more detail, you know, this would be the interface for the BTB. So you give, in, you give it the current PC. Um, so you have a predict function that basically does a, a lookup to predict the next PC in the fetch stage. And then this update method on a misprediction would be called from the execute stage when you, know, you have a, a branch that is taken. Um, and you didn't predict the right uh, next PC, then essentially execute would call this update method to train the predictor to basically insert the right PC next PC pair. There's also a um, you know another subtle detail here. Sometimes you might be predicting a branch taken, right? And so you have a valid PC next PC translation, but it turns out that this branch is not taken. And so you need to retrain the BTB the other way, right? You need, you need to delete the entry, mark the entry as invalid, so that next time you do PC plus four, right? Essentially, you predict that the branch is not taken. OK, so this is a good way to improve performance of, of uh, parts two and three of the design project. In fact, for part two, if you really work hard at it, you can actually get, um, you know, do all the, all the um, redirection and next PC computation in the decode stage. But that's if you really, really want to, um, you know, if, if, if you really work on reducing clock cycle time, you can do it under the 550 um, picosecond target that, that uh, part two requires. Um, but if you don't go that far, it's actually really easy to, to use this BTB on the Fed stage and get good prediction accuracy. Okay, so this brings us to you know, the last part of the lecture, which is 
Um, our BTB is doing a decent job at storing targets, and this is in fact the main way that uh, modern processors decide where to jump. But there's also you know, better things that we can do to predict whether a branch is taken or not. And so consider, consider this very simple loop where we have some instructions, right? And then we're decrementing a counter, and when that counter uh, is zero, we fall through, and if it's not zero, we jump back. So how many mispredictions are we going to have per loop with the BTB? So let's, let's go through this. So suppose that you're in the middle of the loop and you've already taken the branch out a bunch of times, right? So now we keep going, it's, the branch is taken, 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 and the BDB is going to store the right next PC for that because we've trained it, and so it already has the right prediction, right? So in steady state, we're going to be predicting taken, 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 100% right. But now we get to the last iteration, right? And so this is not taken. So in the last iteration, we mispredict because the BTB is saying, no, no, this branch is taken. You should, you should keep doing one more iteration of the loop. And it, it turns out that we fall through, right? So when we exit the loop, we're going to have one misprediction. But what happens when we go into the loop the next time? Yes. Exactly. So at that point, we've trained the BDB to say, well, no, 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 this is not taken now. It stopped being taken. And so we're going to take yet another misprediction when we start the loop. So what can you do to make this better? Well, one thing you can, one very simple optimization is to, instead of having just a valid bit, have two bits that we treat as a saturating counter to essentially give some hysteresis to the process. So every time that a branch is taken, suppose that we have two bits per BTB entry. And um, you know, on taken, we're going to increase, we treat this as a counter going from zero to three. We're going to increase this counter on taken and we're going to decrease it on not taken. When we have a zero or a one, we're going to predict not taken. And when we have a two or a three, we're going to predict taken. And so what happens in our loop now is that you know, we're, we're predicting taken, 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 taken on each iteration. So the branch is biased as strongly taken. Now we hit the last iteration of the loop. And so it is not taken, so we go down to weakly taken. But we still predict taken because it's been taken so many times before. And the right thing to do, you know, it's more likely for these, for these brands to be taken in the future. And so when we hit the, the first iteration of the loop again, we, we are going to see that it is taken, and so we're going to go back to strongly taken. And so in all, how many iterations, how many mispredictions per loop here? We've gone from two down to one, right? Okay, so at a very high level, modern processors actually have many of these more specialized predictors. So they, will, they all have a BTB, but then they have specialized predictors for branches, for branch direction, uh, for return address prediction. So for example, when you have function calls, it will remember the PC that you're, that, that you're expected to return to. And in a return instruction, it will feed that PC to, as, as the next PC, loop predictors, and so on. And so basically, there are lots of predictors that are specialized to particular program behaviors. Um, and along the pipeline, the processor is trying to, as soon as it gets more information, it tries to, if it detects that uh, it's gone down the wrong path or it believes it has gone down the wrong path, it will try to redirect control flow to reduce the misprediction penalty. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, modern processors basically are just relying on a handful of techniques, deeper, wider pipelines to get good CPI ideal and then out of further execution on branch prediction to reduce the impact of hazards. Now, these techniques have been very good to get uh, high sequential performance. So you write a serial program, it runs really quickly. Uh, they unfortunately ran out of steam in the mid 2000s and so um, you know, since then we've moved to multi-core processors that integrate multiple of these processing cores and this will be what we will discuss the next week. But next lecture we'll uh, still 
uh, stay on, on uh, single core high performance processors and we'll see how to do bypassing uh, in blue spec and other uh, tips on the design project. All right, thank you.